All right. Hope you can hear me. Let's see if I got everything set up here. Man, I don't. I don't know if I'm here to uh, to what's what's the phrase uh, to uh, bury Caesar or to praise him. We'll, we'll find out. We'll find out about uh, about that. Um, hello, Zach. Hey, hey, Marshall. Nice to see you. Pretend I can see it. I know you're there somewhere. Um, on uh, on C plus plus Twitter, we we blame JF for pretty much everything, and uh, usually good reason for that. And just as an example, um, JF did a talk for the for the committee, a presentation in two thousand nine, and uh, he used this famous quote of uh, "Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it." And in his presentation, he referenced you know who, the person of the quote and everything, but he references me referencing him, referencing Acock, referencing Bartlett, referencing Santiana with the quote. And he's referencing me in the future because, because it's a talk about the past, a quote about the past, so he references me in the future because, you know, that's, that's what JF kind of does. Oh, and he says that I'm going to reference it in a screenshot from a slide on Twitter. So <clears throat> there you go. I have no choice about this. Um, so the problem was when JF didn't tell me he was going to do this, um, I had to define, I had to figure out a talk that, that this quote would make sense for, and, and at least in somewhat talk about the past and not repeating the past and, and things like that. And so this is, this is that talk. And, and I very much blame JF. His timing was off, by the way, because of, you know, COVID. He, he guessed C++ 20, uh, C, CPP con 20, but, you know, whatever. Um, quickly, very quickly, I work Christy. Um, there'll be a quiz later, so pay attention. Um, we make projectors, really, really big projectors. That's the full-size human. I should have had banana for scale there. Um, that's, a, I don't know, feeding tubes on into the projector or something. I don't know what that is. It's liquid cooling or something. That's Matt. Everyone say hi to Matt, my coworker. Um, we also make giant seamless video walls. That's about, that's not even half the size of the wall back there. It's bigger than I could fit in a picture. Um, but my team works on uh, projectors and aligning them. And so if you take four projectors, for example, and uh, point them at a wall, I can make it look like one seamless image. Or take six projectors and put it on a curved uh, dome that's kind of maybe like a flight simulator or something. I can make that look like a nice, smooth, curved image. Um, we can do it on theaters. That's actually Lego people. That's a really kind of small theater. Um, but we do it on big, real size theaters. That's, I don't know how many projectors, six or eight projectors or something. Uh, hockey rinks, basketball courts, things like that. You see, you see the opening before, you know, before sports. Uh, giant, that's, that's Canada Parliament. That's uh, Russia, Moscow, Red Square. <clears throat> this is a great car, really is a great car. We're projecting all the light on the car. We're projecting the, the, the shiny bits of, of reflection on the car, that's just fake. It's a red car, it's a blue car, it's whatever color car you want it to be. Um, and basically what we do is we point projectors at an object, press a button, uh, do some magic, uh, what we call structured light of the, the checkerboards and things like that to get certain patterns. And, and I mean, every, a lot of people are doing object uh, recognition in computer vision now, but ours is a little different. We're not trying to like, don't hit that thing with a car. We're trying to figure out down to the pixel, where, where is it at? So it has to be really pixel accurate. And uh, that's what we do. Um, and the only reason I mention this at all really is because uh, I am gonna mention cameras and projectors and stuff. So you'll have some idea what I'm talking about. You don't really need to know what, how it works, but. Um, I'm also on the committee, I've written some papers. These are my successful papers, the ones in yellow. So I, that's a pretty good track record. Um, these, if you're only gonna read one paper, read these two, they're the best. Um, I, hate I hate talks that waste time on the overview slide, um, cause you know, but this talk is pretty much gonna go in this order as you could expect. And I'm just gonna go through the, the, the principles um, and have a thing to say about each of them. But uh, first, a little bit of history, uh, as Bob mentioned, uh, it started out in around 2000, um, Robert Martin 
uh, came out with a paper called uh, Design Principles and Design Patterns, um, where he had uh, four of the principles, uh, O L, you know, oldie wasn't he didn't call it oldie, um, but he actually didn't have four principles. He had ten principles, but the other ones are kind of separate, more package kind of principles. Um, and then, um, and these principles aren't just from him. This this was built up over time. Uh, you've got uh, Barbara Lizkov and Jeanette uh, Wing, who did the Lizkov principle. You've got Bertrand Myers, who did Eiffel, uh, designed by contract. He, he, that's where the open, open close principle comes from. Tom DeMarco, uh, did cohesion, which is where a single responsibility came from. And you can trace it back, some of it back to Dijkstra, et cetera, right? It's, it's like everybody, we, we're, we're all building on top of the people before us. Um, and then uh, in 2002, um, Bob made a, wrote a book where he did add the single responsibility. So now he's got S and he's got sold D. And it wasn't until 2004 that Michael Feathers is like, you're missing out, man. You've, you've got a beautiful acronym there. It's solid. You just got to rearrange the letters. Um, so by, by the time he did his next book, which was until 2008, it was clearly called solid because it's, it really is a good acronym. Uh, who doesn't want to have solid code, right? Um, but I, so, so that's kind of where, where the time period is. And at the same time, uh, if you think about it, uh, we got boost boost was happening around the same time period started in, in 99, um, the first BoostCon, which was the start of, you know, C++ now came from BoostCon, was in 2007. Um, the, you know, I shouldn't say this because, you know, I'm doing a keynote, but the best keynote ever was Sean's, the very first keynote of BoostCon. Um, don't go look it up. Don't, don't try to compare mine to, mine to his, please don't. Um, actually, it's quite literally you had to be there because it's not online. Um, <clears throat> But you've got Sean's work, and before that, you have Stepanoff with uh, the STL in the '90s, um, which is very solid, but not typically solid in the way we talk of all cap solid. Um, and it's just a thing I've noticed that there's kind of this great divide between, like Paul was talking about, object-oriented programming, but there's this other faction of C++ that does what I call value-oriented programming. And it's pretty safe to say, I, 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 at first I wasn't even going to tell these guys that I put their, that, that's uh, Dave Abrahams and, and Eric Niebler is the other two, um, that I was going to put them on the slides. And I thought I better ask them, you know, are they okay with being on this side of the slides? And they pretty much all said, yeah, I hate, I hate object oriented. I, I'm totally put me on that slide. And I know Alex uh, was, you know, pretty strong about, he hates inheritance. Sean's like, uh, in, in, inheritance is the base class of evil. Um, I'm actually not that far. I, I, I'm trying to use both, try to be in the middle. Um, but but it's part of what I've been trying to figure out is is why, I, to, to, to give you the, the, the secret is I don't like solid, um, but I like all the letters. Individually, I like each of the letters, but the, but the result sometimes ends up being too object-oriented in, in my opinion. So that's the part I was trying to figure out. Um, so yeah, those are the names in case you didn't know, but you should probably know. Um, and uh, a lot of people have been doing solid talks lately. Uh, Phil did one in, in just earlier this year, which was called Solid Revisited. That's a that's a really good title, Phil. I like that title. Um, you'll notice though that he has no comma in his version, right? right. Comma, totally different. Syntax, very important, comma. Um, and I got to mention JF again. He redid his presentation at, at CPP Con last year and note that he predicted the name of my talk would be called Solid Revisited. So, you know, I've had this title since before Phil made his talk. And, uh, you know, let's go even further. Phil um, does a, a podcast with John, John who uh, helps organize this conference and CPP Con. They, they both... Uh, do CPP chat, the, the podcast. And I was on it, episode 76, which was June of last year. And in that episode, you can like scroll to frame 1615, uh, where I say, my talk title is called Solid Revisited. And there's Phil, you know, just in the back of his mind thinking, oh, that's a good talk title. That's, huh, yeah. Anyhow, 
I, I'm not, I'm not bitter. It, I'm not bitter. It's fine. No, it's fine. Um, and uh, just last a uh, couple of weeks ago, episode 80, I was on again with uh, uh, Klaus Ingelberger. And uh, because he also did a talk on solid uh, last year, although Phil didn't steal his talk title. Um, but anyhow, uh, and uh, Phil's talk references an earlier talk by Dan North, um, why every element of solid is wrong. Not quite that extreme, but. And before that, uh, Kev Kevlin Henney did a talk on solid deconstruction uh, in, in 2013. And uh, note that deconstruction is a very postmodern terminology, right? Who else did a postmodern talk? I did, I did a postmodern talk in 2017 uh, at uh, this conference. And also, uh, uh, you know, maybe I've often wondered, are Kevlin and I this, actually the same person, right? Some kind of connection there between the two of us. Um, but also, uh, Juan Pei Boulevard did a postmodern talk at the same conference as me. We showed up at the conference with uh, talks with similar names. And then in uh, 2019, he did a talk called Value-Oriented Design in an Object-Oriented System, right? Like comparing that value-oriented to object-oriented. In the same year, I did a talk called Value-Oriented Programming in an Object-Oriented World. That's pretty darn close to titles, right? I, we also might be the same person. I just don't know it. It's a little bit of fight club happening there. Um, my talk came out first. But actually, we and this is the one time where we actually worked together to make sure we had the same talk title because because uh, that's we eventually realized we constantly have the same talks. Um, so may as well may as well organize it. Um, and in his talk, he references Rich Hickey, who's the inventor of closure, who is also referenced by Phil in Phil's solid talk. So, you know, that's how this all works. Just trying to follow along. Um, that's some of the people, some of the talks out there that um, I'm building on some of it and uh, all, all worth watching, but not right now. Um, so this is pretty much the overview, solid. Um, and they are all principles, but... Um, the code is more what you call guidelines than actual rules. You know, they're not necessarily hard and fast principles they're kind of just guidelines um but let's 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 dig into it and uh single responsibility is probably the hardest one to define uh hardest one to know that you've got it right but it's easy to know when you've got it wrong um and i should also mention that my overview that uh, my you know plan of this talk is actually at least half the talk is is s the other ones, everything is is in support of S. Um, so let's let's dive into S. Um, you know, single responsibility. Is this? Is this people still use this meme? Oh, okay, good. Thanks. It's good to know. All right. So in my code base, I have this uh, class called Model in all caps because you have to yell it whenever you talk about it. Um, and Model holds everything. Um, that 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 is its job. The uh, the kitchen sink really messes up the Git repo, but uh, it, everything's in, inside a model. Um, and you know, it has a single responsibility. It it holds everything. That's that's one responsibility, right? Um, it actually also does everything. Uh, sadly, because to a certain extent, holding everything, someone does have to hold everything. There has to be that 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 Uber object at the top but it doesn't have to do everything. It could delegate to, to sub objects, right? Not take responsibility for everything. Um, so if we dive into one of those sub objects like camera, let's just look at a simple, right? I said, I use projectors. I use cameras to see the, the light coming from the projectors. Um, let's look at what the camera, what, what a camera does. Um, you know, we use these, they're, they're certain type, I forget what they call it, computer vision projectors really, machine vision, cameras, I mean. Um, and we have a lot of stuff to take to keep track of because it really is a complicated problem that we're trying to solve. So you've got, you know, some simple things, network path, bit, bit depth, things like that. But we've got the pose. We have to actually figure out where the camera is in 3D space just by looking at where the projector pixels are landing. We figure out where the camera is. Um, we have this binarization thing we do. It has a threshold and sharpness and 
all these other things. We have a bunch of images that we track to, to subtract images and all this kind of stuff. Some of these, I don't even know what they are. Just, you know, went digging through the code. Um, there's a mutex in there. Um, uh, you know, I'll let you guys guess for later, you know, to tell me later, how many, uh, things do you think that mutex is guarding out of the 20 or something things here? How many things are guarded by the mutex? Um, but if you imagine this as a class, it would just look like this. And how often do you see a class uh, where the member variables have been like subsectioned into, into small subsets, right? It's like one set, two set, red set, blue set. Um, if your class has the member variables broken into subsets, it's probably not a single responsibility class. It's probably got, you know, six responsibilities or something. And what's happening here is, is, you know, those pieces are fairly simple, but now you've pulled them together by association, right? And, and maybe you've had a function that does some stuff with the pose and it just uses pose and calibration. And it's, it's okay. It's still separate from the other pieces. They're just really close nearby. You've put them in the same class, but you know, pose this pose function is only using pose and calibration, you know, so it's not that big of a deal until you know there's a bug and someone needs to fix the bug. So they're like, oh, I just gotta like shut off the image polar while I'm doing this or something like that, whatever an image polar is. And then there's another bug, and it's like, oh, if I could just knew what the flag was in the config, I will just you know, do something right now. And then it's easy. You, you, uh, you can just fix the bug, check in the code and, and it's easy, right? There you are. You just, you know, get her done. And, you know, Rich, Hick Rich Hickey, we're mentioning in his talk, he talks about um, the word simple and complex and um, complex comes from the Latin word to fold or to braid or to, to, to weave, right? And something that has no folds or only one fold is, is simple, like single fold. And complex is many folds. And then there's, he uses a word called uh, complect and complecting, which is an old archaic word, but uh, he likes it. I like it. Let, let's make it a real word again. That basically means interweaving. It's, it's that process of interweaving stuff and, and entangling stuff, right? <clears throat> so when you put a bunch of stuff together in a class, even if, each of the functions in the class keep have everything separate. What you've done is you've made complexing too easy, right? The, the everything else you need is right there. I've got this pose function. Oh, I just need this one other thing. It, it's not far away. It's it's at close at hand, right? And that's actually the the Latin where easy comes from. It comes from close at hand. And so we're making the, the we're making it too easy to to you know, cross the streams. Don't, don't cross the streams. You want to keep this stuff separate. You've, you've associated, it is all associated to a camera, but you've brought it too close together. And, and, you know, you don't want to cross the streams because it would be bad. That's, that's all the Ghostbuster said. It just didn't really explain it. Um, but it's bad because it makes changes harder, right? You get into the state of making a change over here, causes something to break over there because everything is in, in, in entangled and inter intertwined, right? And the real thing about single responsibility isn't described as it has one responsibility. Uh, the original description is it has one reason to change and should only have one reason to change. So uh, the camera class probably has way too many reasons to change, right? Um, I like to describe this as another version of KISS, which is, Keep your stuff separate. That that is the goal of of single responsibility. It's just keep your stuff separate. Um, so you know if there is an important association between pose and image polar or something, you know maybe that's an invariant. Then sure, put those things. Those things have to stay together. But if everything is mostly just indirectly associated with camera, because yeah, camera camera has these things, then you should somehow keep them separate, right? Otherwise, you're going to get back into this state again where everything's intertwined. Um, by the way, that critical section uh, guards one thing, and then it guards the network health monitor, and they're not even listed together in the header, but whatever. Um, so 
we still have this problem though, where we need to manage camera stuff. It needs to go somewhere, right? Like we, we, we have all this data, the problem requires all this data, but where do we put it if we don't just stuff it all together in a camera class? And we actually can put it together in a camera class that we just call the camera stuff holder class. If we just say, um, the only responsibility of the camera stuff holder class is to hold the stuff and not do the stuff, right? It is, has one responsibility to maintain the association of these of this data. This data is associated with the camera, but just have a free function that does the pose stuff, right? As long as it's not trying to maintain invariance, you know, maintain those invariants elsewhere. The main invariance of camera stuff holder is hold the stuff. Just this stuff is associated with the camera. If a camera is deleted, we know to delete the camera stuff, you know, things like that. It's just keep that class simple, single responsibility. Um, another way of doing that is you could have a different setup of an entity holder, which holds all the camera stuff for all the cameras. And you look up the stuff you need, you know, pass in the camera ID, or you could have the pose stuff in a, in a pile and the network path stuff in a separate pile. And you ask each one by camera ID, give me the pose for this camera, right? Um, and people talk about uh, uh, arrays of structs versus struct of arrays, right? And, and there's reasons to use one over the other. Sometimes one's more efficient and everything, but the, the, the thing for me is how you maintain that association of all the camera stuff I should be able to change that responsibility from like the one on the left to the one on the right without changing anything else, right? Single reason to change. I should be able to change from A to B and my do post stuff function doesn't have to change because it's just a function that someone else gets the information out of the camera holder, hands it to the pose function and off it goes, right? I should have had a clock to know what time it is. Okay, it's fine. Um, and you know, if you do end up needing a flag to fix that bug in the pose stuff, you will pass that flag in. And actually what you've done is force the developer to, um, to pause and realize, oh, why, I, I need this flag that's over there in this function. What is the proper way to, to get that information from A to B? The proper way probably isn't just go grab it wherever it needs. like we the problem one of the problems we have in our code is that almost every so many classes have access to model because we have this one giant model class and a bunch of people have pointers to it so often you're in a function and you're like oh if i could just get at that flag and you're like well i've got model i could point to camera which could point to config which can point to the flag and it's like that's probably not how you want to write your code that's called um La Demeter, De Demeter, Demeter, um, of like basically don't have a bunch of arrows in a, a line, right? Um, uh, so you don't want to make that that interleaving, that complexity. You don't want to make it easy to do the complexity. You want to keep things that flag separate and and force you to get it from the right place, pass it to the right place, store it in the right place. Um, and one of the things you'll find when you separate out these functions is you'll find functions like binarize, which maybe used to be a function of camera, and instead it becomes a function uh, that's just a free function. And you realize that the binarization threshold is only ever used in this one function. And you go look at the code base and you see that every time people call binarize, they, they take an image, they set the binarization, and then they call binarize. And it's like, why didn't you just pass the value into the binarize function? When you have functions like binarize that, that uh, take no parameters and return nothing, um, uh, Richard Powell has a really good lightning talk. Again, don't, don't watch it right now, uh, but look it up later, uh, about being very sarcastic on how not to pass arguments to functions, right? And that's one of his techniques is, uh, is, is that. There, there's, there's questions, I, I'm gonna peek at them, but... Uh, Uh, and I'm going to ignore the questions for now because I, I it's 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 we 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 missed it. I'm going to keep going. Right? Um, so that's single responsibility. <laughs> but wait, there's more because it's important. So I've got another example, uh, a smaller example. 
let's say I have an image class, which I do in my code. I have an image class. <laughs> and it looks kind of like this, actually. Uh, surprise, surprise. And it only has like four variables, right? It's got uh, pixels, format, width, and height. And, you know, its job is to, you know, allocate some pixels, make sure it matches the width and height and the format. Um, it does file reading and writing, and it does some image processing. It does image stuff, right? That's all this class does. Uh, you could say it's co cohesion. It's very cohesive. It does image stuff, right? But um, what about these functions here? How many functions are hiding in that dot, dot, dot? How many image functions do we have in our code base? And, and how many are we going to have in the future, right? There's an infinite number of image functions. We could just keep going, adding functions to this class forever, right? Same with standard string. Standard string has 200 functions in it. And we could, you know, some programs, all they do is process strings. So like the whole program could just be an image function, function or sorry, a string function. You know, why isn't by stock a, a function on string, right? You've got your stock ticker, which is a string, and then by stock, uh, have be a string function, right? It's, 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 it works on strings, right? Um, Everyone likes Wind Waker, right? It's the best, the, the best uh, Zelda. Um, what happens all the time is that when you want to add code for a new feature, it feels like you just go to the closest class and you're like, okay, I'm gonna add the code here, right? You just, classes are made of Velcro. You, things just get tacked onto them. It's like, oh, I need this other function. You know, image could use this other function. And then, oh, I can't quite get this function working in image. I'll add this other parameter. Maybe I'll add the binarization threshold to the image class because then it's right there and then I can do binarization and you know, things just, classes just get bigger and bigger. Um, and they get weighed down. Like if you, if you play Wind Waker, when Link has all these things attached to him, he moves a lot more slowly, right? We don't, we don't want that. So, so what do we do with these, these infinite number of functions on, on image class? Well, we, make them not image, not member functions. We just move the functions down, move that bracket up and uh, keep going. Move that bracket up a little higher. Get rid of that uh, constructor that took a file name and the save function that took a, that takes a file name. Any image class in the world that has load and save is broken, right? Let, let me be clear. <laughs> it should, is bad and should feel bad. Um, I mean, if it's a non-static member function, maybe it's okay, but an image class holds pixels. That's its job. You can do the loading and saving outside of the class. As long, you know, yeah. I, I, every image class I've ever looked at, maybe maybe not the boost gill, I don't know about that one, um, but most of them uh, have load and save member functions. And then I just throw that library away and look for another one. Anyhow, we can then move all these functions outside of image and we have uh, a bunch of free functions and a really small class, right? And what we're left with are the invariants, right? We have pixels, format, width, height, and we have these three invariants that are, make sure the pixels are allocated and deallocated, make sure the width and height matches and the format matches the pixels, right? And pretty much invariants are your responsibilities. Maybe that should be an equal sign. It's definitely it contains. If you have an invariant, it's your responsibility to maintain the invariant or, or delegate it to, a, to somebody. Um, but it might be equal, equal that your only responsibilities are your invariants. <clears throat> um, so we've got three responsibilities here and this is called the single responsibility principle. So how do we get rid of these, right? We can get rid of one of them, the deallocation, by using a smart pointer, right? So it's still our responsibility to, to allocate and deallocate this pixel correctly, but we've delegated it to a member function, a member, uh, the member variable. Um, and it's going to be in charge of cleaning up after itself. And I actually have a class called tidy pointer. It is basically a unique pointer with uh, the deleter is a is a pointer to function um, so that I can take pixels from anywhere as long as you tell me how to delete them. And 
sure, that's 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 more overhead than a unique pointer, but I don't care. I'm, I'm working with images. I've got enough overhead with, you know, the images are a lot bigger, the images are, take more time. The standard function is not a problem at all here. And now I can take pixels from anywhere and delete pixels from anywhere because you just tell me how to delete them. And basically what I've got here is rule of zero, right? Now I don't have to worry about uh, anything. All these responsibilities of the constructor, the copy constructor, um, et cetera, et cetera, the structure, they're gone. In all the previous slides, I just didn't want to type it out, didn't want to clutter up my slides. Now they're actually not there. Before I would have had to write out those, those functions. They're gone because, um, you know, you can, you can count on ints. You can count on ints. Ints do the right thing. Um, and, and tidy pointer does the right thing. And actually it makes this class um, move only because tidy pointers move only, uh, which is actually what I want. I don't want my images being copied, you know, randomly. If I want to copy them, I'll call an actual clone function. Um, so I'll go as far as to say, if your class um, doesn't have the rule of zero in it, it's probably not a single responsibility class because it's doing main, maintenance of some stuff as well as whatever, you know, the job of the class is doing. Unless the job of the class is to be a smart pointer, then that is its only responsibility and it's fine not to, you know, those, those things that make rule of zero uh, possible, don't use rule of zero. It's just how, how, how it works, right? Um, but our class still has two and a half responsibilities, right? So what are we gonna do about that? So one thing, format matches pixels. It's really should be, I should have said pixels matches format. And we kind of see now that it's, pixels, 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 and it really is one responsibility is correctly allocate the pixels, right? Correctly allocate the pixels and maintain that invariable throughout the life of the class. So two, two responsibilities. Right? Our two responsibilities are correctly allocate the pixels and maintain the invariance for the life of the class. Um, how are we going to maintain these invariants uh, with an infinite number of functions that that touch that touch the pixels, right? Or read, maybe write the pixels. Well, first thing we're gonna do is uh, make the pixels private, make all those variables private so no one else can, can mess with our invariants. And great, now nothing can get at the pixels. Okay, wait, now I can't write any of my lovely free functions because they can't get access to the pixels. So we give them access to the pixels. I, I can write a get pixel function and a set pixel function. And what that is, is that's it. I've That's the minimum set of functions I have to give out such that you can now write all the pixel function, all the image functions in the world, right? Load image, save image, you can write all these things with just two, and, and, and we tend to call that the minimal basis functions, right? Here's the set of functions you need to write all the rest. String, string could probably get away with five or 10 functions and you could write the rest on top of it. Um, of course, this act actually doesn't work because I have multiple different types of pixels. I can you know, it could be RGB pixels, gray pixels. So I can't just actually do set pixel or not. I would have to do something like a canonical color format of like, you know, the XYZ true color thing. Um, and then that of course would be like re really slow because I'd be converting colors on every pixel. Um, so instead what I do is give you a way to access the pixels and get them in the right format with some template stuff. And, and it's kind of weird because it's half in the runtime. You can change the format at runtime, but you can access the pixels in templates, which means you end up with a lot of templates and switch statements and everything. But, but it, it works out, it actually works out really well because if you do it right, you can write generic functions that just work. And if you want it to be fast, you, you write this, this specialized function. Um, and that's a whole nother talk. So we'll, we'll do that another time. But um, the point is it, it, it is possible to do this. You write a small set of functions in your class and everything else can be outside your class. And this is just a long way of saying, go read this Scott Myers article, uh, also in the same time period, 2000. Um, don't read it right now, but read it later. Um, I guess that means I should have a picture of Scott. All right, that's a picture of Scott. 
and it's his joke. He's the one who made jokes about him looking like 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 he man. So you know, it's all right. Um, so what you know that that's our, that's our our image class. It's tiny. It has it doesn't have to have a minimal set of functions, but it's got a small set of functions that you trade off fast, convenient, small, safe, whatever you need to trade off. Uh, and, and you know, you get a nice little class in a bunch of external functions. And this makes no sense when I tell people, unless I explained all this to them, I like to say types plus functions equals programming. That's it. Some days I feel like I'm writing C code again, but it's so not C code. The classes still have all the invariants. You still have member functions to control your invariants and all that kind of stuff. But then you have a lot of functions that just take take values, take types, and return and return types. It's just it's good old fashioned functions, right? It's, it's all all the rage. Um, so the most important thing about a class is, you know, the name. And where you draw the line, what is the border around your class? So many classes I see don't have a border. It's just fuzzy. It's like, should this be in the class or outside the class? It's like, I don't know. Well, half the reason you don't know is because you don't even know what your class is because you haven't named it very well, right? If you, if you don't can't name it well, you probably don't know what it is. You don't know what it is. You don't know what it isn't. And if you don't know what it isn't, you don't know what code shouldn't be in it. And so much code shouldn't be in it. So, you know, figure out what your border is you know, outline your class and say, this is inside my class and everything else is outside my class. And here's the essence of what my class does. And, and that, I, I missed my other, my other tweet is essence is the essence of naming, right? That's, that, that's what you got to do. Um, so that's single responsibility. But wait, there's more. Functions, right? Your function should do one thing, just one thing. So here's a function. People have seen this one before. It's one of my favorites. Because uh, I just searched in my code base for step one, and you find a bunch of functions that have way more than one step in them. Um, and you can see that this thing has more than one thing it, that the function does. It does many things. It does step one, two, three, and four. Um, and we could easily turn step one into a function that it could call to say, you know, it, it the, the comment tells you it turns 2D camera points into 3D points somehow. I, I had to leave out the actual magic. Can't show you the magic parts. Um, but it'd be so much easier to show you a slide that says it just calls a function. The function does the, the magic. So let's so let's make that that function, right? And then while we're at it, let's make all these other steps functions as well. I don't know what step three is. I don't care. Call it step three. It it's just a sub function. And now we have a function that still does four things, right? But it only has one responsibility. Its responsibility is to coordinate those four things, right? If something changes about how we convert 2D to 3D, this function doesn't care. It just calls project to 3D. If solve via mappers changes, you know, fine, not my problem. My problem is just make sure it's, I call it correctly, right? Step three, I don't know what it does, but it's not my problem. I've got one responsibility. I, I, my, one, my, my main responsibility is just to delegate responsibility to these other people. <clears throat> so what does um, this function actually do? The function is called apply. Again, takes no parameters, returns nothing. And the comment is magic happens here. So I still can't tell you what the real responsibility of this function is, but I know how to make it have only one responsibility. I am re looking at comments now, but uh, I will, I will, I will, I will ask. I love answering questions normally in the middle of my talks, but it's so weird when you guys are so far away. I'm gonna save it to the end. Also, I'm gonna barely have time, but I'll also be after the talk. I'll, I'll have lots of time for the rest of the day. I'll be hanging out. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I did was search for functions that have the word "and" in them, right? And based on our our naming. Um, this is, you know, I can find our and functions and I get like get width and height and get set min and max. And, and, and there's a whole pile more. I just hear some of them. And some of these are doing one thing like get width and height. 
is really get resolution. No one, it's very rarely that you want the width and not the height. You just want them together. So same with bounds. You just like min and max, set them both, set the bounds of this thing, right? Um, so those functions are just missing a simple type that would make them a single function with one responsibility. Um, and these two, like maybe exposure and threshold is a thing, or maybe exposure and separation is a thing that always goes together. And I'm just missing the simple types. But since there's one function called exposure and threshold, a different one called exposure and separation, I guess they don't always go together. And I actually don't know what separation, I have no idea what separation is. I don't know if it's an int. I don't know if it's even a value or a thing. It might be, a. I don't, I don't know what it is. So I did look at these functions a little bit. <clears throat> And the reason they're put together is efficiency, right? It's like, while I'm doing exposure, sorry, my phone is going Who would leave a phone on? Um, uh, while you're doing auto exposure and you're, you're taking pictures with the cameras, you're putting light out of the projector, it's like, while you're already doing this process, also figure out the threshold or also figure out the separation, whatever that is, instead of taking the pictures twice or, or running through the pixels twice, just do it all at once, right? So, so that that is not, you know, this is a separate group. It's not because these things are always associated. It's we're knowingly saying these, these tasks should be separate, but it's a lot more efficient if we just do, do them at the same time. And as it turns out, the calculate bounds and centroid is the same way. Uh, I wrote this one. I know what this function does. Uh, if you have a point cloud, you, sometimes you need to know the bounding box of the point cloud. So you have to go, I mean, I only do it once when I first get the point cloud and then I save it, but uh, you go through all the points in the point cloud and figure out what the bounding box is. And while you're at it, if you need to know the, the center of mass, or the centroid, you're going to go through all the points and figure out the, the, you know, the average point. Might as well just go through the set of points. And, and, and you know, our point clouds are 100,000 points. I only want to go through that set once. So I'll just calculate both things at once and, and you know, cache them or whatever, right? <laughs> Filter outliers and average is kind of similar. I don't really know what that function does, but it has a big set of data and it's filtering outliers and then averages them because it's the averaging is kind of just a, a byproduct of, of the outliers, right? So might as well do both while you're there. And uh, yeah, I look, you know, this one looks similar. Calculate and save channel extents. It's probably like, well, I was doing this anyhow. I might as well save it or something. But um, what this, both of these two functions are doing, they're going through a set of things somehow, or, or you know, uh, the get and set features, which sounds really weird. What's, what's a function that does both get and set? It's getting a set of features, which I think is feature detection. Uh, but it's getting it from somewhere, a file or XML or something, and then it's going to put it somewhere, right? So it's like, while I'm getting this stuff, I need to put it somewhere. And and you can see what the person's trying to do. They're trying to avoid um, the the intermediate set, right? If I if I get everything, I say, I'll get everything at once, put it into a vector, and then set them all at once. Well, now I created this temporary vector with hundreds of points in it or things in it. And actually, if it's hundreds, I don't really care. Create the vector. Hundred is not a big number, right? But if it's hundred thousand or something, that then I care. <laughs> so, um, of course, you don't have to do it that way. You could also just do half of the work and then make the consume a single function, right? Just you know, when you're parsing XML, you do all the parsing, but then you hand it off to somebody. The handoff is a function. It's not put all the code right here, just make a function call. And of course, if you're gonna do that, why not just make, why not do both, right? Make your half the code that does all the producing, make that a function call, make all the consuming a function call. And, and I really don't care if that, if that consume is a, is a interface that you passed in or a standard function that you passed in or actually is a hard coded function. Because if you just make these two things hard-coded functions, you can, the refactoring, hard part of refactoring is done. If someone else is like, oh, I want to consume this, I want to send it to someplace else. And then it's like, oh, well, it's easy to take this function 
change consume into a, a standard function and bam, we're done, right? Um, so, um, and of course, you know, Sean would say this is a standard transform or somehow it's probably a, a rotate, Everything, everything's a rotate. Um, but what this efficiency is then is not really efficiency of like avoiding creating a vector, it's e programmer efficiency. The programmer was just like, I just need to write some code. I need to get this code done. So I'm just gonna write the code, the, the, the straightforward way. And, and I, I don't understand, I, I don't code that way. I, I think I'm starting to realize just like literally while I was making these slides, I started thinking maybe I don't like to code. I like being a programmer, I just don't like writing the code at the bottom, right? When I look at this problem, I think, I think, you know, what if I had a, already had a function that just got all the things and another function that said all the things? Uh, what if I had a function that did, did all the producing parts for me and then a function that did all the consume parts for me? My job would be so much easier. I would just have to call these two functions. I don't have to write all this messy code because I guess I don't like writing code, right? I, I would rather call code that someone else wrote, which I know is gonna be me in, in you know, a half hour later, but I can procrastinate and make that future me have the problem of writing that code, right? So I often tell people, write the functions you want to see in the world, right? If, you, if you're just going, oh, I wish there was a function for this, call it and then write it. I sometimes do that, I, I, I do that to my intern students. They're like, hey, how do I get the, you know, the config file name. I'm like, well, you call the function, get config file name. And then I leave. And then later on, they're like, there's no function called get config file name. I right, well, write the function that you wish existed. And then it'll exist from now on. Item six on the agenda, the meaning of life. Now, uh, Harry, you've had some thoughts on this. That's right, yeah, I've had a team working on this over the past few weeks, and uh, what we've come up with can be reduced to two fundamental concepts. One, people are not wearing enough hats. Yeah, people are not writing enough functions. That's, that is, it's, it's that simple, just, just write more functions. Um, and these last two uh, are convenience, right? Like. We often upload images to the projector. When you, you upload it, it doesn't actually show it right away. Then you send it a separate command as they display the image. But often we wanted to upload and display it right away. So we just put it together into a function. And get and log status. It's like, uh, you know, I just I just want to do these functions right away. And if that if that those functions only did those two things by calling A, then calling B, that'd be great. But of course they don't do that. They do all the steps of A and then all the steps of B crammed together. In fact, you cannot get status without logging it. You can only call get and log status. There's, there's no other way to get status in, in that, that code. I was, and and it's, it's not even just A then B, it's actually intertwined. It, it does, that function does three things. It gets the status from, from like it's a Windows function call service status thing, and it converts it to an enum of our, our own type, you know, so there's a conversion going on, which is cool. And then it logs it and, and then it returns it. And it's, anyhow, it, it has more than one response building. And those are and functions, right? Functions that do multiple things. There's the other thing is or functions, right? That, that set exposure and threshold is both an and and an or function. Because uh, you pass flags in, right? Because, you know, there can be exceptions to what this function does, but no more than 32 different things, right? Um, and that this code literally looks like it does a bunch of stuff about exposure. And the very last thing it does is checks this flag and it like removes cameras that couldn't see, you know, if camera B doesn't see projector A, you can remove it from some of the lists and stuff like that and just clean some stuff up, which is useful, but this is always called hard-coded. We pass the flag hard-coded into this function and the very last thing it does is do the thing that we're asking it to do. So I'm pretty sure this could look like this. I don't even have to, I should have took the flag off. Don't even have to pass the flag in. Just, I know that I'm gonna call set exposure and threshold, and then I'll remove the cameras myself. I, I don't to understand why this function has two responsibilities and they're, they're 
responsibility A and, and or B. Um, the other kind of or function is, I often see functions like this, right? That has a big, the whole function is an if else, which means that is two functions cohabiting one function, but it's literally two separate functions. And often, same thing, you call them with, with a hard-coded true false, so you know which branch you actually wanted. So maybe they should have been two separate functions, and you just call the right the, the, the right function. Um, and of course, you get the beautiful, beautiful giant switch cases with with uh, hundred lines in every case. Um, I think Marshall said he had a seventy thousand line switch statement he saw once. So if these functions did just you know the if statement calls another function does nothing else then I'm okay, right? That means what you've done is abstracted. The higher level function is like, do the thing. I don't care which case it is, just do the thing. I, I wanna think of it from a high level and you can handle the low level. But once you get into the low level, call another function. Don't just, just delegate your responsibility to somebody else. Who wants to be responsible for things? I don't wanna be responsible for things, delegate it. What was that about hats again? Oh, uh, people aren't wearing enough. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so we could just do the whole talk on, on S, single responsibility. Um, but I just like to think, keep your stuff separate. And let's actually move on. I have to figure out what time it is it. Yeah, OK. Open, close principle. Now I'm going to go a little faster from I'm not going too fast, but I have less slides for the other ones. Um, open closed is from Bertrand Meyer, and it is a software artifact should be open for extension, but closed for modification. This was literally originally about, I've got a struct X, Y, and I want to add a Z to the struct. Well, derive, add the Z in the, in the derive class. And now, you know, cause you can't just add items to a struct and expect everything to work. Right. And a lot of this all depends on how you are publishing and shipping items. It's like, you can just add a Z to this struct if you are in charge of all the code, but if you're, if you're exporting this code as a library or something, then you have different problems. But, um, but it's also a much more general idea now, right? Of just like, how can I manage change by locking down some of the code? This code shouldn't have to change if I just want to extend um, some other code. So in my code base, um, Mystique, by the way, is the name of my product, that uh, our product that does uh, the projector magic. Um, Mystique talks to a bunch of different projectors. Christie's got boxers and griffins and crimsons and all these different projector types. We talk to them all the same through a projector interface. And if we want to add another projector, we can add another projector, no problem. It's open to extension by adding another projector. And Mystique and the projector interface are closed. We don't have to change them. We can extend without changing stuff, which almost works. Um, I'm not sure if it ever worked 100%, but uh, it kind of makes sense because what happens is when we get a new Whizbang projector, you know, the Whizbang 3000 new projector from Christy, uh, that projector has a new feature. And I need to call that new feature. So I need to add the new feature to the, to the interface. And I need to call the new feature and the projector interface, you know, everyone has to, it still goes everywhere. Um, but it's, it's actually not that bad. Like 95% of extension was, was fine. And it was just this last, and, and it means we've actually are changing Mystique. We're adding a new feature to Mystique at the same time we're adding a new projector, which usually is what, what happens, right? Because we make the software, we make the hardware, we, we do everything. <laughs> Um, but it has become such a problem that we actually have reflection, our own little ref reflection feature where we can, we don't have to, because in this case, we actually would have to also change Boxer, Griffin, and Crimson to do something when we ask for a whiz bang feature, you know, like return zero or do something. Right? Um, what we actually do is we can ask a projector if it supports a feature and then we can exec the feature and we have a whole kind of reflection mechanism 
to make this a little easier on ourselves, but but and, and it mostly works. So that that's closer to the traditional way open closed is done in in object oriented programming. And like our camera class, we've added cameras without ever changing anything because we just need to take pictures and set exposure and a couple of things. You know, when we when we added color cameras, then suddenly we had to you know change the interface. But you know. Again, this is a guideline, not a not a rule, but it it, it mostly works. And and object oriented programming is is one way to, to make this work. Um, and that's just because uh, yeah, right. Mystique needs to call this stuff, so that's why the interface changes. The interface is changing because Mystique needs the change, so things are going to change, right? Because we are actually changing behavior. And solid. All the original writing about solid was how do you manage change, right? You're trying to be changes going to happen in your if you're at all successful, things are going to change. You're going to, you know, get version two, um, and and solid is all about managing uh, managing change, which makes me think it should have been called liquid or super fluid or something, um, something less rigid than solid. But you know, the letters work. Um, the classic example is uh, the shape example that everyone uses. Uh, shape has a draw function, and then you derive circle from shape, and it knows how to draw. You derive rectangle from shape, and it knows how to draw, and et cetera, et cetera. You make a bunch of classes that, that derive from shape and know how to draw, right? Um, now, here's the question, though. What's going to change first? How you draw a circle or the definition of a circle? Because last I checked, circles are circles. They they are kind of say the same. But you know that surface thing I passed into the drawing function. You know I used I've drawn circles in Windows GDI, DirectX, OpenGL, uh, direct to it, just straight to the pixel buffer, CUDA. You know I've changed how I draw circles a heck of a lot. Right, Bresenham, Bresenham circle algorithm. I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but a circle. Uh, a circle has a radius and an XY, right? That that doesn't change. That okay, maybe the int could be a float or something, but pretty much circles don't change. You know, they're mathematically we we figured those things out, right? So if I write a draw function, that's the part that needs to change. My circle class doesn't need to change, which means I could go back and make my shape class maybe a variant across all shapes, right? And and that draw function on a shape will figure out how to draw a circle, how to draw a, a rectangle and everything. And of course, again, we're gonna take that draw function, take it out of the class. And you haven't totally gotten rid of the problem, right? You're still, what, you've, you've, you have introduced the problem of when I add a new shape, I have to go and change the shape variant. I have to write the draw code, but I would have to draw, write the draw code anyhow. It's just, where do I put the draw code? Now I'm gonna put the draw code with all the other drawing code, not with circle, right? So it depends what you have as to whether which way is a better way to go with this, right? But what I'm trying to avoid is this complexing, right? If circle derives from shape, shape is gonna end up with a draw function. It's gonna have a serialize function because we wanna serialize our shape. It's gonna have a bunch of other functions that we need on shapes. It's gonna have infinite, the, you know, infinite functions on, on the shape class. And circle is going to implement all those. And once again, we're going to have a bunch of code that's cl too close together. And we're in danger of entwine, intertwining our code, right? So keep your stuff separate. Don't make complexing easy, right? Now, what you're going to end up with is all your drawing code is near your drawing code. All your serialization code is near your serialization code. Sure, if you add parallelograms, you have to change the serialization code to do parallelograms, you have to write that code somewhere. It, it is a trade-off. I just feel that this keeps your code separate, which is my number one rule, right? So you, it depends. And what you're doing here is predicting what you think will change more often in your code, which is, is hard. Even JF doesn't quite predict completely accurately, right? But, you know, circles don't change very often, right? Like it's, sometimes you can just find a class in your code base. And you're like, I'm pretty sure this one's solid. 
solid in the sense of it really isn't going to change, right? Other than get get your types right, but then it's, it's probably pretty pretty good. Um, although also, circles don't have x y. This is this is like I hate people that put that don't hate people. Sorry, uh, people that put load and save on their image classes. I don't like that. Rectangles with x y width height. Rectangles have width and height. Circles have a radius. They don't have an x y. X y is an extrinsic parameter of a circle. The the radius is an intrinsic parameter of a circle. If I show you these two circles, you say those two circles are equal, they're the same. Well, they're not the same, they're in different locations. How could they be the same? They have different x, y. It's like, ah, x, y is not really a property of the circle. x, y is a relation between the circle and the layout or the you know, screen or something, right? It's actually owned more by whoever owns the circle, owns where the circle goes, most likely. The, you know, the, the, the draw layout thing owns where the circle is. The circle just has a radius, right? There is a one-to-one -one correspondence between circle and its position. And I, I remember, I still remember when I first started programming and I realized, wow, things that have one-to-one -one correspondence, maybe I should put them together. And, you know, nine times out of 10, maybe, maybe not nine, eight, seven times out of 10. Yeah, that's a great idea. But Sometimes you got to stop and think. It's like, no, this is actually not. It hap It's one to one, but but it's not the right relationship. Um, and and even if you think about if in in PowerPoint here, if I take a circle and I cut and paste, it doesn't paste to the same spot. It pastes down and over one because it's not the same position. It's the same circle, different position, right? So there is actually a point there where it knows intrinsic versus extrinsic properties. Something to keep in mind. Um, if you really think it's intrinsic, call it circle region, right? A circle region, these two, these are two different circle regions. One's over here and one's over there. If I'm in one region, I'm not in the other region. There's a house in this region. There's a, you know, dog in the other region. Those are two different things. And then it becomes intrinsic. So maybe it's just about naming, but it's about what is the essence. Essence is the essence of naming. Okay, that's OCP, open close principle. But wait, there's more. Our good old image class. Our image class is not a object-oriented hierarchy or anything, but it is closed for modification and open for extension, right? We, we already set it up properly. It has the minimal set of functions that you need to be an image, and all the extensions to image can be written outside of that. Now, if you do have to add a new format, Okay, that might be a little complicated. There's ways to deal with that. Like I actually have a lot of those, a lot of those free functions would still work with a new format because they call other, they rely on the other free functions. There's only a minimal outer set that I would have to write. And some of them would work, could probably get it so they all work. Some of them just slowly and I have to decide whether I care. Slow is good enough. Um, and then I could optimize it later, right? Um, but that's not, I, you know, object-oriented means different things to different people. Some people just having a class with encapsulation is object-oriented. For some people, object-oriented is more about hierarchies and inheritance and interfaces and stuff like that. Um, to me, objects is about identity, right? A button is an object. It has, it's a thing. You don't make a copy of a button when you pass it to a function. Whereas an integer doesn't have identity. You just pass it in along. Unless you take your int, make it a global variable, and now it has an identity and then suddenly it works like an object. Everyone can reference it. Sean, Sean will say reference semantics versus value semantics. Anyhow, my image class is more value-like. Um, because it's move only, it's kind of in between, but because it's move only, you tend to return it from a function and, and either move it into a function or take it by reference or something. Uh, it's very value-like. That is open closed. So Liskov. Uh, Liskov substitution principle is done by Liskov, but also Jeanette Wing in 1994 wrote a paper on this, and it's very simple. Uh, let phi x be a property provable about objects of x type t, but what? I, what? Okay. Um, what this is saying is it's defining what is a means, right? If you're doing a subtype, if S is a subtype of T, then S is a T, right? And they're trying to define what does that mean to be 
uh, a subtype. So if I turn the steering wheel of a car clockwise, the car is going to go right, I hope, because a car is a vehicle. And what we're saying is the you know, property of steering wheel clockwise goes right. That's, that's the phi. And phi of car works the same way as phi of vehicle because a car is a vehicle. And if you got in a car that, you know, you went turned right and it went left, you'd be like, this is not what I was expecting of a vehicle. That's basically Liskov. You want to substitute car for any vehicle and it works like a vehicle, works like you expect it to. There's a subtle problem there called, uh, now recently called Hiram's Law of a car doesn't work exactly like a dump truck, right? They both turn right when you turn the steering wheel, but a car turns right really quick and fast and a dump truck is just like, oh, you know? So if you try to make that turn in the dump truck going really fast, you're not gonna make the turn. They don't work the same. And if you rely on that API to work exactly like it used to, then you can't substitute anything. You're gonna like, you know, a circle is not a shape. They work differently, a circle and a rectangle they purposely are different. How can they be, you know, both shapes? They have different, they somehow act differently in their APIs, but somehow it's the same, right? And what it really is all about is what are your contracts and what are your expectations on these APIs? Um, like my projector, uh, they all get name, they all can set a color, they can all shutter, and maybe they do slightly different things. Maybe one does it faster than the other, maybe one's brighter than the other, but they can all do these things. And I can write unit tests. And in the unit test, I take the base class. I take projector as the base class and do whatever I can unit test. Right? Uh, name shouldn't be empty or whatever it is. Um, and I can test all three real projectors with the same base class unit test because I expect them. Basically, my unit test is telling you what the contracts are. Until we get contracts put into the language, all I've got is comments and unit tests to tell you what, what, the, what the contracts are. Um, and in concepts, go watch Jeff's talk after, uh, when it gets online, uh, he talks about this. Um, this is totally, I don't know how to do concepts. This is wrong. The syntax is wrong. I assume it's wrong. Maybe I guessed it right. I used to know. I wrote papers on concepts, um, but I haven't, I haven't got my hands on them in, in, in quite a while, but concepts are the same idea, right? If you say that some type, some thing S is a sequence. It's like, oh, it's got to begin and begin returns an iterable and that has certain properties and an end. And, and I can go from, you know, I can, I can go from begin to end and then I can make a whole bunch of different sequence types like vector and list and, and vector. Like why would you actually ever use anything but vector? But I hear there's other containers um, and they all work like sequence, right? but it's not uh, the traditional object-oriented polymorphism, it's static compile time polymorphism. And it's kind of cool that we now have concepts to, to describe, so which, you know, people sometimes don't realize, concepts and contracts are very similar, right? Concepts are saying, here's our compile time contracts. This is what a sequence should be. And contracts are saying, here's our runtime uh, contracts of what this thing should be, right? Um, and I often wonder if we should use similar syntax and stuff like that. Um, there are big differences too. Uh, concepts are doing duct typing. They're just saying like, if you do this, if you have a begin, I hope it does the right, you can't actually check everything about a concept uh, at compile time. You can't check that it semantically does the right thing. You can only check syntactically, but uh, you know, they're very similar. Uh, so concepts and templates are another form of Lipskov substitution. So if you pass your type into sort and your less than doesn't do what less than is supposed to do, your sort is broken because you did a bad substitution. You broke Lipskov. Right? Um, and, you know, we could test unit tests all our sequences uh, by proving, you know, try to see, can I get from begin to end or something like that? Yeah. Um, and I have another example. Uh, I have, it's just hilarious to me that it's only been the last six months that I have these three classes in my code. I think we had line, maybe, no, I didn't, we basically didn't, have, we just passed points around, point start, point end. And finally I got sick of seeing two parameters start and end all the time. 
I passed a line. And then I realized we don't always use these the same way. A line is infinite in both directions. Array has a starting point and goes off infinite in one direction, like say light coming out of a projector. In a line segment, you know, we might be using in our 3D model of the screen, there's just little line segments and triangles and stuff like that. They're the same data, but they're different types, right? They 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 both they all just have a pair of points in them, but but they're different. And when I was writing this up, I was like, do these derive from the same class? Uh, you know, what is that common base class? Um, and I actually started out trying to figure out like which one's the base. Like, is is line segment the base, and line is just an extension of line segment? It's, it's like a line segment, but it goes off into infinity. An array, you know, goes off in infinity in one direction, kind of thing. It's like they're they're they're, they're line segments, but Whoops, just skip to. Um, if I try to write a, a test that uh, works with lines or or a test that's templatized on to work on any line-ish type, you know, do I get the same answer? And so like, can I intersect lines? Can I intersect rays and stuff like that? And I mean, as it turns out, you can't intersect any of these things because lines could be parallel and they don't intersect. Um, if the lines are in 3D, they can be not intersecting because they're, you know, 3D. Um, rays don't intersect because one, you know, even if they're about to, one's, you know, I guess the diagram, that ray does intersect, but the line segment doesn't. So if you try to write some kind of code that says, I'm going to treat lines, rays, and line segments all the same, it's like, no, they behave differently. They, th there's no is a between these three types, even though, they look exactly the same, right? Um, they they behave differently. So so don't derive one from the other. <clears throat> Liskov tells you that you know the, the these properties are not the same. We cannot do we cannot derive these types from from one another. We maybe could make a base class that they all derive from, and then that comes down to does that base class have any real meaning? Like, is there some commonality? What do I even call that base class? Line base something kind of, you know, if you have, if your classes are just called common, that they, they, they have no meaning, right? You don't know, again, you won't know the essence. You won't know what's in the class and what shouldn't be in the class. Um, so I may or may not have a base class there, but the other interesting thing that to me was that I was trying to decide, okay, they don't derive from each other, but can I convert from one to the other? It's easy to convert from a line to array. It's the same data, right? I can convert from a line to a line segment. I can convert between all the all three of these things. So I could make my constructors and this code there would, would all work. Uh, maybe I'd have to worry about ambiguity in some places, but you know, you can work it all out. And then my question is, is that a good idea to have these things convert from each other? And if you imagine a function that takes array and I pass a line to this function, it's not gonna behave like a line, it's gonna behave like a ray. And a line isn't a ray, a, a, a ray. so they shouldn't, they shouldn't automatically convert between the two. Cause you know, I'm trying to substitute a line for a ray there and it's a bad substitution because they're not the same thing. So it's okay to write the conversion, you just make them explicit, right? So I can explicit constructors from lines and rays or explicit conversion uh, operators, whatever, however you want to do it. Um, and this means uh, I have a update to a paper that, to write for the committee because I have a whole set of rules for when we should use explicit or not. And Liskov is, is a litmus test for, for should this conversion be explicit? or even more than explicit and be like a separate function or something. Um, and, you know, the other thing while I'm, while I'm complaining about member functions, you can cross, you can intersect lines with rays and rays with line segments, and you can ask what is the closest they ever come to each other. Uh, and so if you had this function, which class is it a member function of? You know, is it a member function of a line that takes a ray, a member function of a ray that takes a line? It's like, no, you just make uh, uh, a free function that, that you, know, you know, the secret is at the end of the day that 
uh, there's flags on these three things. And the flags are, does it start or stop at the beginning? You know, does it go into infinity or not at the beginning and at the end, right? But those flags are compile time flags. So I can pass these compile time flags to my generic function that says, take the points with whether begin and end goes to infinity or not and do this calculation. And the calculation is almost exactly the same, you know, couple of cases. And, and I've got this beautiful function that can find the closest, how, how close lines and rays and line segments get to each other. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful function. So that is Liskov. <clears throat> We're on our way. Interface segregation principle. <sighs> Let me tell you a cone, right? A cone, I'm just gonna have to not explain what a cone is. Um, but it's a story, right? A short story with, with, with uh, enlightenment at the end, hopefully. I guess I will explain what it is. So, you know, the master is out uh, walking his dog and he decides to stop by one of his students and, and the student's like, oh, you know, comes to the door. It's like, master, thank you for visiting me. I'm so, I'm so happy that you visited me. And the master's like, ah, you know, I was just out walking my dog. But, you know, I stopped, well, I thought I'd stop by um, while I'm here. You know, I was just wondering about your function. Yeah, why does it take a big common struct instead of just taking x x and y? And the student's like, well, you know, big common struct is where we keep x and y, master. Of course, of course, I'd pass big common struct in. And then the dog barks, right? Just just at just at the right time. Uh, and and the master's like, uh, sorry, my my dog's hungry. You know, and the student, of course, you know, for the master, he's like. Well, sir, let me prepare a feast for your dog. Let me, what, what, what would your dog like? I will pre prepare food for your dog. I would be honored to prepare for you, food for your dog. And master's just like, nah, just open the fridge. Let the dog take whatever he wants. All right. So there's enlightenment in that story. Hope, hope you found it. Um, the interface segregation principle is, you know, as originally written is no client should be forced to depend on methods it does not use. I like to say, don't give them what they don't need. Don't pass in stuff that a function doesn't need. Don't pass in big common struct if you just need X and Y. Don't open the fridge and let them just take everything out of the fridge because don't make complexing easy. If you pass big common struct, it's all going to get entangled in there. That function is going to end up using pieces it should, you know, should have been using differently. Right? So I have an example of this. I've got very important function. I need to know if this projector is facing north for some reason. And if I need to know, you know, I need to know if it's facing north. Well, I'll write a function called is facing north, and I'll get the orientation do some math, check if it's, you know, five degrees within north or something like that. And, you know, who am I kidding? No one's going to write that function. They're just going to take that code and stick it in the other function, right? They're not actually going to write a separate function. But let's pretend you learned one thing and it was write the functions you want to see in the world. When you're sitting there, you go, I need to know, is it facing north? Call a function and then write the function is facing north, right? So you go along. And then eventually you're gonna be like, oh, different projector needs a different tolerance for north because reasons, whatever. And so I'll just stick in, I've got the projector right there. I'll check its type, unfortunately, but you know, it works. I'll check it in, fix the bug, ship the code, we're good. And then, you know, oh, well, geez, this is gonna turn into a switch statement on all the projectors and, and then it's starting to get really bad. So I'm like, you know what? I need a get north tolerance on my projector interface so that I don't have this switch statement here, you know, or something like that. I start, start, start doing that. And, you know, if I was really smart, I would just put is facing north maybe, but uh, maybe I'm not that smart. And before I even get to that, I need to know the camera. Is the camera facing north? I also have that problem. So then I'm like, wait a second, both projector and camera derive from device. Uh, I could put orientation as a base class, make, make device have an orientation function. Um, but you know, I've got media servers, which are also devices and they don't have orientation. They're just boxes in a corner that play media, play, play videos. Um, so, you know, what the heck I can make device have a default implementation of orientation or make a hierarchy of directional devices have orientation, but, but base devices don't have orientation. 
you know, build up my hierarchy here and stuff like that. Wait a minute. How did this happen? We're smarter than this. So, so, so I just had this feeling we're going down the wrong path, right? Oh, I missed that. I could have had Padme going down a path I do not want to, I cannot follow. Next time. <clears throat> um, if we back up to the beginning, right? We had this function. We needed to know, are we facing north, right? And, and so we went and wrote this function. We passed in a projector and we wrote the function we needed. And all we needed was orientation and tolerance. So the traditional object-oriented interface segregation approach is to make an interface that is just those two things, right? This is all this function needs, so only pass it these two things, right? So here's the interface for this function. It just needs this, which is very similar to, to templates, right? The sort function only needs less than, it, you know, and, and move on your, on your type. And if you've got that, it works and it's not going to call anything else. It shouldn't anyhow, but there's no way of guaranteeing that, but whatever. Um, and it's the same way. We're, we're, we're going to guarantee that this function only ever calls these two things because this is the interface we give it. We're not going to give it the, the we're not going to open the fridge and give it everything, right? And then if it does later on need more, we will, you know, be careful about how we expose more stuff to it instead of exposing everything to it. We'll try to keep our stuff separate. Um, and that's that's interface se segregation. So projector will have this interface and it'll implement it. But you know what? Why, why, why still? Why are we doing this, right? Just pass direction and tolerance. Why have an interface that gets you these two values when you could just take the two values? They're, they're just values, it's just a function, right? I don't need to make an interface. If it was bigger and more complicated, there's sometimes I, I would take an interface, but if it's simple, just pass the concrete types. We don't write string interface so that we can get each character by calling them a virtual function. We write string, we just use string. Actually, we write string view, which is, uh, the generic interface over string, but it's at compile time, so it's fast, et cetera, et cetera. But anyhow, just pass a simple type in, right? Just pass what you need. Small, concrete, simple vocabulary types, right? Orientation is used everywhere in our code. I don't mind just passing that in. The way I like to describe this is code top down on the way down, bottom up on the way back up. So what I mean by that is when you first started, you said, I needed a function that tells me north. So if you need something, you call a function. Oh, no one's written the function yet? I'll start writing this function. Here's my is facing north, takes a projector because the guy who wrote the very important function said that's what he needed. He needs to know if this projector is facing north. So you're working top down, you write this function, you figure it out, you know, do the dirty work, great, done, ship it. No, you don't ship it. You've worked your way to the bottom of the code. Now you work your way back up. And on the way back up, you notice you only use orientation and tolerance. So pass that in. Now you have a bottom up function that only takes what it needs. And then you go back to your original code and pass in what the function needs. Top down on the way down, bottom up on the way back up. And use small concrete types, right? No problem. Last one. Dependency inversion principle. The most flexible systems are those in which source code dependencies refer only to abstractions, not concretions. Small concrete types. Hmm. All right. Solid is all about change, right? So I can make, go back to the shape example. I can make shape and have Mystique depend on all these things, right? And this is kind of, you know, the, the, the goal of dependency inversion is say, I don't want to depend on circle, rectangle, blah, 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 blah. I just want to depend on the interface. I only have one dependency and I don't care about circle and, and, and square and everything, right? Great. Um, and Really, it will be three interfaces because we're going to use interface segregation principle. These are three separate interfaces I'll depend on, but it's still small, very small interfaces, and I don't depend on the implementations. Nice and flexible. 
Although Kevin Henley, uh, Kevin Lynn Henney, uh, in his talk, he's like, how do you have three, you know, shape is going to implement all three interfaces, but we have single responsibility. Like circle should have one responsibility, but it's got three. It's got draw, serialize, and infinite. But let's ignore that part for now. You know, this isn't that bad. It's got small interfaces. Mystique is going to rely on these small interfaces and not rely on the concrete implementations. But this is also not that bad. Here's small classes that are maybe smaller than the interfaces, right? And they these classes are, are kind of end nodes. They don't have further dependencies. I mean, they do point, but point is everywhere in my code base. It's just a simple type. These things are like as close to pods as you're gonna get, right? Um, so this is also small and it rarely changes. I know what a line segment is. It's fairly simple and, and they're vocabulary types. So I have no problem with depending on these things and still, I believe my code is still flexible. So if I was to depend on particular projectors, the Boxer and the Griffin and these you know, projectors, that would be bad. That's what traditional dependency inversion says. Don't do that, depend on projector and all these other projector, concrete projector classes can be off to the side and you don't have to worry about them, right? So that's, that's the traditional object-oriented approach, but it's not the only approach to it. This is also good. And that is the last one. But everyone who makes a talk on solid has to come up with another acronym, right? Phil did plasma. One of the A's is abstraction. The P is is uh, permanent uh, persistent types and whatever. I don't know uh, what Kevlin's is. He did, it wasn't even in his one talk. I saw it's in a different talk. He did it. Um, so I, you know, I'm open for I, I'm open for ideas here for what it is. I did I did think maybe fluffy. Fluffy is kind of nicer than solid, and I, I only thought of that because. Functions. I really like functions. If you haven't if you haven't figured that out yet, um, so all the absurd functions. What was that about hats again? Oh, uh, people aren't wearing enough. Maybe functions. Lovely, uncomplected, free functions. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I was. I, I wanted to. You know, I'll just warn you right now. Last slide. This is the last slide. I wanted this slide to just say, keep your stuff separate because that is, that, that's kind of the point of solid. That's the, I really believe it is the only rule of programming and everything else is just techniques to help you keep yourself separate, keep your stuff separate. Some people don't say stuff, they put a different word in there, but keep your stuff separate. Um, still starts with an S. Um, and everything else is just techniques and trade-offs of which, how do I keep my stuff separate? But you know, I really love classes that are made of Velcro. It's my new favorite saying. So I had to put, I had to put a bunch of them here. Um, you know, some of them are about, about functions, some of them are about classes, and then the types plus functions is, you know, put it all together. And, and, and that, that is my talk. Um, I, I saw some questions. Someone asked about format, you know, I think format and pixel type and width height just can't be separated. But um, I think, I don't know if we have, we have no time sometime. Someone tell me what, what I'm doing here. I will hang out afterwards. Um, I, I should just be quiet because I know you're all still clapping. Um, but who, who's in charge? We can, uh, I think your, your mic just cut out, Tony, but we can go Hello. long for a bit if you want to answer some questions. Yeah, I'm good. If you can still hear me. Yeah, my hear you my uh, screen said your internet connection is unstable for a second there. All right. Um, I should try to answer the questions that are, that are up here. Is that, is that, how, that, that how this works? Single responsibility comes at the expense of ergonomics in an API. 
sometimes, however, is the primary driver for popularity when there are many options. What you're suggesting makes for beautiful code, but it does not make popular code. I don't know if I understand you, David. I usually understand what you're saying. What are your goals and are they universal? Well, I've answered that now. My goal is keep your stuff separate. Like keep whatever it takes to keep your stuff separate. Um, basically, I do think solid just turns into object-oriented over object-oriented code. Not every class needs to be an interface. We have a lot of code that um, there's an interface, then there's an implementation, and there's only one implementation. And while well, there's two, there's another one in test, right? Which is, so it's good for mocking. I can mock out the concrete implementation with a mock, um, which is kind of cool, but in the real code, there's only, when I change the interface, which happens a lot, I change it twice. I change it, the interface and I change the one implementation and I change it in test. Like the, the interface isn't in any way solid in the sense of being tied down. So what was the point? I mean, it is useful for testing, but um, the reason I gave this talk was because I really don't like solid, but I like the letters when they're used, you know, like it's just, but everyone ends up in, in this, like uh, Stepanov STL is solid. It's like single, like vector has one responsibility, right? It, you know, however you describe it, it's very well-defined class. It does its thing, does nothing else. Um, you know, it doesn't have a sort function because it's a, it's an algorithm. Um, you know, all of the SDL is solid in that sense, but it's not object-oriented in the sense of traditional object-oriented. Um, I don't know, other than giving crazy talks like this, how to convince people slowly over time to come to the value side. Um, Uh, should we also separate format? I don't know if I understand that question, and I'm going to say no because they 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 are an invariant. The format must match the data, and the data must match the format. Uh, do you think composition supported by the range library can remove? Ooh, that's a good question. Remove the need for functions such as calculate bounds and centroid. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Um, yeah, I should just run over all my points and pass in like. Yes and no. Um, we can turn it into compile time. I, I, I don't want to pass in the, I don't want to pass them in at runtime, like, a, like a, a standard function to be like, what do you want to do on these pixels or, or these points in the point cloud? Because um, that would be slow. But at compile time, yeah, I could, I could have a thing that just runs over the pixels or the points and do a for each and pass in a chain of do this and do this at the same time. And that's really nicely separated. I like that. Uh, stuff holder versus single responsibility. What do we do about why practice of saving RAM by mixing substructure fields based on alignment? RAM is free. RAM is so darn cheap. It's it's free. I, I gave up on that. I don't, I used to do that. I used to put my chars with the, put the big, the big objects first and then the small objects later. Uh, the universal, you know, I, I sat in a committee meeting one time and, and I listened to uh, Howard Hinnett describe how he guessed wrong on, on, um, on some performance thing. He said, he's like, I thought this would be the way. And then I measured it and I was wrong. I'm like, okay, if Howard's wrong, no one gets away without measuring stuff. So if you measure something and tell me you need to reorder your fields to be faster, then you need to reorder your fields to be faster. Like my, my image class, I do have some, you know, it's a delicate balance between I need this to be fast because I do stuff on every pixel. And at the same time, I want to protect, like my image class, when you ask for begin, if you, if you pass in, the, it's like, I know the format's RGB and I'm writing an RGB function. You say begin angle bracket RGB. Give me the, the first pixel of the RGB buffer. If it's not an RGB buffer, it throws. It just says, which maybe isn't the right thing. It should probably be, uh, you know, terminate or something, but whatever. Different types of 
things for different types of programs. Um, but it basically, I think it both the certs and throws, it says you've done something wrong, it's the wrong format. But I've got all these balance in between, I need it to be fast, but I still want separate all my image processing code from the code that owns the pixels. How does S fit in with the current practice of header only libraries? I, you know what? I mean, the problem, depends if you mean header only libraries or it's one giant header or if it's multiple headers, because I don't mind having a giant header if each class inside the header is small, right? So, so single responsibility just tells me make small classes that don't do five things, do one thing. Um, maybe this is my, the last, the last question to it. Let me, let me just look here. Uh, yeah, refactoring and the trouble of predicting what, what might change worth it. Yes and no. It's it's worth it because programmers are lazy. Um, most of the, it, I, I have this other, I had slides at the beginning, I had to take them out. Code, if you think about what makes good code, you will say it's maintainable and readable and thisable and thatable, all these properties of good code. And, and good code works, that's the other property, right? It has to work. And what I describe it as good code begets good code. Good code means you will call this stuff and your code will be good because my API is easy to use. Um, this future code would be good because I have laid the foundation of, I've kept the code separate. And if I've separated, you won't accidentally complex the code together, right? you have to start out with do your best effort to separate things. Somehow you're going to guess some stuff wrong. This is a really hard question for me because honestly, I don't, this, this is, this is a joke, but it, somehow it's not a joke. I don't guess wrong. I just get this right all the time. So uh, I just separate the code the right way. And then five, 10 years later, I've got code 15 years later it's still separated correctly and it didn't get complected because the foundation was laid and people didn't just grab the thing that was at hand, you know, they kept things separate. Anyhow, we can go over to gather town or whatever and do Q and A and, and I think that's it. Thank you. Whoever, at least one person, two people, i watch watched people listen to me and all, everyone else who I can't see except for Marshall and, Zach, I can see those guys. Thank you.